I'm sure most of you who follow the Delphi murders are aware that this past Wednesday, they unsealed 118 documents. I spent about six hours reading the documents and creating a summary of the main points of each. A few days ago, I did a live chat with the most interesting points from the documents, but a few people asked me to share my entire summary document of all 118 unsealed documents. So this video is for people who don't feel like opening 118 PDFs to figure out the most important points of each one. So I'm doing this video to save time for my subscribers. I'm gonna be showing 89 PowerPoint slides with a summary of every single document. So for people who like my videos, you may wanna take a Red Bull to stay awake. And for people who only watch my videos to fall asleep, bookmark this video. I am not going to show a lot of the actual documents in this video because it's just quicker to include the facts in my summary slides. Plus, most of the facts in the documents are buried in between confusing legal mumbo jumbo, so it's confusing to read. All 118 files released by the court were combined into one zip file, which is a way to collect and compress many files into one file for downloading, and then you separate them out. So the file numbers that I reference in this video are the order in which they were listed in the zip file from top to bottom. They seem to be random file names and not chronological or related in any way other than numerical and alphabetical based on the first few characters in the file name. I renamed every file based on the numerical alphabetical order in the zip file and created a new zip file that I uploaded to my website for anybody who wants to download them now. You may want to do that before you continue watching this video. So if I summarize a document during the video and you want to read the full thing, you can easily find it based on my numbering system. My PowerPoint includes the original file names not with my added number at the front of it. Just a refresher before I start, the key legal people in this case for the defense are Rosie and Baldwin, Rick's public defenders, the prosecutor, Nick McClelland, the first judge, Diener, and his replacement, Judge Gull. Also, Westville is the prison where Rick is staying, <laughs> or maybe I should say being held. And if you see the capital letters IDOC, it stands for Indiana Department of Corrections. In the top left of every slide, there's going to be a number, and that matches up to the numerical or alphabetical order from the zip file, where these 118 files were all combined into one file. Below that will be the full original file name. If you download these files from my website, it will show 5-1 and then the rest of the file name. Every slide will also include a filed by and then the date followed by the legal title of the document and then my summary. So document five was filed by the Indiana State Police Laboratory Division on October 19th, 2022, although it was filed on June 13th, 2023. It was a certificate of analysis and included a microscopic comparison of a 40 caliber SNW cartridge. SNW stands for Smith & Wesson. The results were the cartridge found at the crime scene was cycled through Rick Allen's gun. They performed the test from October 14th to the 19th. Interpretation is subjective in nature and based on relevant scientific research and the reporting examiner's training and experience. Next up was document number six, which is somewhat similar. It was also filed by the Indiana State Police Laboratory Division on October 19th, 2022. Before I review the items included in the analysis, I just wanna review what a cartridge is. Some of this terminology can be kind of confusing for people who don't know about guns. So I searched this and a cartridge looks like this. This is a 40 caliber Smith & Wesson cartridge. This shows the anatomy of a cartridge. On the left here, you have primer. At the top, you have the cartridge case. On the right here is the projectile or the bullet. Inside here is where they have the propellant or the gun powder. It also says lead here and metal jacket over here and here is the flash hole. When you hear people talk about a magazine, it's not People Magazine, it's this type of magazine that gets inserted up into the gun, and this has room for 10 cartridges. So the items included in analysis, Rick's gun, which was a Sig Sauer P226, three test fired and cycled ammunition, two cartridges, one was found in Rick's gun, and one was found in a wooden keepsake box on Rick's bedroom dresser. Magazine capacity is 10 cartridges, one magazine containing eight cartridges, and one magazine containing nine cartridges, so 17 cartridges 
All 17 of those cartridges were manufactured by Blazer. The cartridge from the box on Rick's dresser was a 40 caliber SNW cartridge manufactured by Winchester. The cartridge from inside Rick's gun was a 40 caliber SNW cartridge manufactured by Blazer. The analysis showed the cartridge from the crime scene near Abby and Libby's bodies had been cycled through Rick Allen's gun. A test fired cartridge was entered in IBIS database and sent to BATF National Correlation and Training Center for review. Description of the tests include microscopic comparison. In this video, I'm gonna focus mostly on the summaries and not do a lot of commentary, but I wanna bring up a few things to get viewers' perspectives. So Rick had two magazines that held 10 cartridges each, but only 17 total were loaded. So three cartridges were missing from the magazines. Two were found at his house, one in his gun, and one in a keepsake box on his dresser. One was found at the crime scene, so that's 20. However, there are a few things that don't add up to me. All 17 cartridges in the two magazines were manufactured by Blazer. The one in the dresser box was made by Winchester. So who manufactured the bullet found at the crime scene? Blazer, Winchester, or another company? I've never seen any confirmation. Also, did they do a DNA or fingerprint test on the unspent round found at the crime scene to see if it matched Rick? So why would Rick keep one gun cartridge in a wooden keepsake box on a dresser in his bedroom? At the end of the bridge, when Rick encountered Abby and Libby, did he pull the slide back on the gun, not remembering there was a bullet inside, and it popped out that bullet, and then he picked it up, put it in his jacket pocket, and then it fell out at the crime scene and he did not know it. Then did he remove that second cartridge that loaded into the gun and kept that at home in the box? It's likely he did not know until October 13th, 2022, when they came knocking on his door, that there was an unspent round found next to the girl's bodies or that he was a suspect, so maybe he did not have a reason to throw it out. The report did not say if the keepsake box cartridge was totally new or if it had marks that it had been loaded into the gun. Do any of my viewers have any guesses about these three bullets that were not in the magazines? Write in the comments below what your thoughts are. The next most interesting document was number nine. It was filed by the judge, but there is no date or official signature. It was a draft that was not executed yet. The title was Supplemental Order on Safekeeping, and Judge Gull orders the Indiana Department of Corrections to transport Defendant Allen to the Cass County Jail. Defendant Allen shall remain in the custody of the Cass County Sheriff pending a resolution of this cause. Just to be clear, Rick still seems to be at Westville and has not been moved to Cass County. This was just a draft. Document 37 was filed by the defense on May 19th. Motion to convert let bail hearing into suppression hearing. That the accused files his motion to suppress fruits of the search of his home. So basically, after Rick's defense lawyer said he has nothing to hide, they filed a motion to hide everything they found at his house. <laughs> In case you have not heard, Rick's house has recently sold. Document 39 was filed by Robert Baston, who is a prisoner at Westville in the same unit as Rick. It was filed on April 11th. Some of you may remember about two months ago, we heard about a letter from an inmate and people were not sure if it was from Rick or another inmate to the court. And it turns out that it was from Robert Baston. The murder sheet recently did an episode where they talked about this guy. He has a history of filing complaints against the prison, so keep that in mind. My summary of his letter is two clerks of the court from inmate in same unit as Rick. He said Rick and other inmates are being mistreated at Westville. Corrupt officers are teasing Rick and calling him a kid killer. Other inmates are telling Rick to kill himself. Then he went on to make a variety of further allegations of prison corruption. On March 21st and April 9th, Baston attempted suicide, and then he complained in his letter that the Indiana Department of Corrections has not provided him with mental health treatment. Document number 52 was filed by the prosecution on April 20th, a motion for leave of court to subpoena third-party records. So the prosecution requested all mental health records from Westville. They included the summary of the case, which was pretty much the same thing as the PCA. It said clothes belonging to Abby and Libby were found in Deer Creek. This version was not redacted, so the references to the witnesses from the PCA were just initials. Rick's prison cell is on constant video surveillance. Rick was placed on suicide watch when he arrived at Westville 
based on his statements about harming himself, but he was taken off when his mental health improved. Rick was allowed recreation time and was exercising. Overall, he was described as quiet, read a lot of books, did crossword puzzles, and exercised daily. Continuing with document 52, this is where it gets a little cray cray. On April 3rd, Rick called his wife and quote, admits several times that he killed Abby and Libby. His wife, Kathy Allen, ends the phone call abruptly, end quote. Soon after, the defense filed their motion to modify safekeeping order. Here's where it gets even crazier. Rick was, quote, wetting down paperwork he had gotten from his attorneys and eating it. He was refusing to eat and refusing to sleep. He would go days on end refusing to sleep. He further broke the tablet that he used for text messages and phone calls. He went from making up to two phone calls a day as of April 3rd to not making any phone calls at all, has not made a phone call since April 3rd. Things that make you go, hmm. On April 14th, Rick was evaluated by two psychiatrists and one psychologist to discuss his turn in behavior and a need for involuntary medication. It was determined that Rick did not need involuntary medication or to be moved to another facility. Since that April 14th meeting, Rick began to eat and sleep, and his behavior began to return to what it was prior to making the admission on April 3rd. The prosecution believes there is Westville video evidence that will include Rick's admissions, plus his behavior prior to the admission and directly after. The prosecution needs those records to refute the defense claims. Document 58 was filed by the prosecution on June 13th. State's objection to defendant's motion for order on continuing disclosure of defendant's mental health records. So the state wants access to Rick's mental health records due to the defense allegations of lack of competency in their emergency motion to modify safekeeping order, also their request for due process hearing, and letters from the defense about Rick's mental stability at Westville. Quote, the defendant has admitted that he committed the offenses that he is charged with no less than five times while talking to his wife and his mother on the public jail phones available at the Indiana Department of Corrections, end quote. Holy crapoli. The state believes these admissions are going to be challenged by the defense because of a lack of competency of the defendant. The state is concerned about the ability to respond without knowing if the defendant is competent or not. Document 59 was also filed by the prosecution on June 13th, state's objection to defendant's motion to suppress. On May 19th, the defense had filed a motion to suppress the evidence found at Rick's house on October 13th of last year. The defense said that search warrant lacked probable cause, failed to establish items to be seized were in the residence or could be expected to be in the residence, that the affidavit failed to provide particular information that particular items related to the particular crime would be found in the home, and that the affidavit failed to connect generic items to actual items that were possibly used in the crime. It was also revealed that investigators reviewed Delphi evidence and on September 21st, 2022, they found Rick's 2017 interview. So after that, they reviewed witness timelines and statements and the Hoosier Harvestor video which showed Rick's car headed to the CPS parking lot at 127. Document 59 continued. On October 13th of last year, police asked Rick and his wife to speak to them to follow up on his 2017 interview. Law enforcement believe a knife was used in the murders. Based on the Allen's October 13th answers, law enforcement prepared a search warrant on October 13th for their home and knocked on the door at 5 p.m. and finished their search around 7.09 p.m. that night. Witness number four who saw Rick on platform one of the bridge, plus the muddy bloody witness who saw a man matching bridge guy's description at 357 walking on the road, and one of the juveniles who passed Rick approaching Freedom Bridge, said the man they passed matched the man in Libby's video. Rick has admitted passing those girls around Bench 1 near Freedom Bridge around 1.30, but he has not admitted seeing Witness 4 or being on Route 300 at 3.57 p.m. This document also included a very long list of items taken from the Allen's house on October 13th. It was kind of confusing, so I consolidated it into different categories. Are you really surprised? So gun-related items, Rick's Sig Sauer P226 gun, a gun cartridge in a wooden keepsake box on the dresser in their bedroom, a gun cartridge in the gun, 
one gun magazine with eight cartridges, one gun magazine with nine cartridges, a handgun case, a Winchester Supreme Elite empty ammo box. I looked online and some examples of this ammo box contain between 20 to 1,000 rounds or cartridges. I counted 16 different cell phones that they took. I'm not gonna go through all of these. They took three pairs of boots. There were about 16 knives, four multi-tools, which I think are like Swiss army knives, miniature katana with a red tassel, which is kind of like a small sword, a sheath. They took three jackets. One was a blue jacket with red stripes made by Adidas, a black and gray North End coat. No, it's not North Face and a blue Carhartt coat. This is the list of sweatshirts. There were seven blue, four black, and one unknown color. So I wrote here, why was there no brown shirt or sweatshirt taken, like the one that might be hanging out underneath Bridge Guy's coat or waist? I'm sure you all know there's been a lot of speculation about that brown thing around Bridge Guy's waist. Is it a shirt or sweatshirt hanging out, or is it some kind of fanny or gun pack? For jeans, he had three pairs of blue Arizona jeans, size 34 by 29 plus two pairs of blue Levi Strauss. There's been a lot of debate online about what is on Bridge Guy's head. So this is a list of head coverings they took from Rick's house. I will read through these. A winter gray hat with fur-like fibers, brown fitted cap with a small bill, black WRI stocking cap, black NASCAR Ford racing stocking cap, black Adidas stocking cap, red, white, and gray brown Canada stocking cap, gray and black Adidas skull cap, gray and white NFL Colts skull cap, and a brown Carhartt stocking cap, plus multiple headbands. For computers, they took two Hewlett Packard laptops. For those of you who don't know, a memory card is a small device that you plug into a computer to store files, like pictures, videos, PowerPoint files, Excel files. So they took a one gigabyte memory card, a two gigabyte flash drive with Rick on the back, a one terabyte hard drive, an external hard drive, and a 32 megabyte SD card and a 256 megabyte SD card. I know we're all curious to know what was found on these cell phones, laptops, and memory cards. For electronics, they took an iPod and a car GPS device known as a Garmin Street Pilot. These are the last two items. Related to his car, cutting of a carpeted area underneath the spare tire of Rick's Ford Focus, and this was noted for lab exam, a swab from a driver lap belt, swab of driver shoulder belt, and two swabs from the passenger side carpeted floorboards. Various items, custom vehicle operations motorcycle cover bag containing a motorcycle cover, Aquafina water bottle, 10 pairs of gloves and one extra glove, a blue fabric strap, and a blue and green fabric strap. That completes the list of what they took from Rick's house. For those of you interested in seeing the official document of items removed from Rick's house, I will show it on screen now, so you might want to pause if you want to read it closer. Document 107 was filed by the prosecution on April 14th. State's response to defense's emergency motion to modify safekeeping order. This document has a lot of information that was presented at the June 15th hearing. The state had a meeting with Westville's warden on April 6th, and the defense allegations of mistreatment are false. Rick did not receive the discovery paperwork because Westville tried calling his defense for several days in a row and had to wait for the defense to advise as to how the paperwork should be handled, whether in his cell or in another location. This document also included an outline of the conditions Rick will face if he is transferred to Cass County Jail, which are not as extensive as Westville. Rick was to be evaluated for mental health on April 14th. It also included an affidavit by the Westville warden citing facts about conditions at the prison that contradicted the defense team's lies. Rick is not allowed face-to-face -face visitations due to being in the segregation unit. This document is from the warden of Westville, where he provides answers to the defense team's previous allegations about conditions. 
I'm not going to read through any of these, so you're going to have to pause if you want to read it. That concludes the section of my video that I felt were the most interesting and new information. I'm now about to review documents 1 through 118. So if you're not interested in extreme details, I would suggest going to do something more exciting. Documents 1 and 2 were just these photos that had been previously released. Document 3 was filed by the defense on May 19th. They summoned Westville to permit the defense to enter Westville for inspecting, measuring, surveying, and photographing the individual cell blocks and surrounding facility. Document 4 filed by the defense on June 9th. It was a subpoena to the state of Indiana to summon prisoner Robert Baston to appear for a hearing on June 15th in the Carroll County Circuit Court to testify in the above captioned cause and return this summons. We know that that prisoner did not show up or testify on June 15th. Document 7 was filed by the defense, but there was no date. The defense serves upon Westville a subpoena and request for production to non-party. It said see attachment, but there was not any attachment. Document 8 was also filed by the defense, but there was no date or official signature. The court grants defense's request and orders the Indiana Department of Corrections to release any and all mental health records associated with Rick without the necessity of the execution of consents and or waivers by the defendant Allen or his agents. Document 10 was filed by the judge, but there was no date or official signature, and so it was just a draft. It was a temporary restraining order. The court grants said order and directs Indiana Department of Corrections from videotaping any attorney-client conferences. The defendant's legal team shall be afforded the opportunity to utilize their laptop computers and cell phones when meeting Rick. Further, this matter shall be scheduled for hearing on Defendant Allen's request for a preliminary injunction on blank date that was never filled in. Document 11 was also filed by the judge and also a draft. The court orders the Indiana Department of Corrections and or any other departments and or individuals assuming care and the custody of Rick to release to the defense all mental health records. Document 12 was filed by the defense on April 5th. Emergency motion to modify safekeeping order. We've already seen this a few months ago with the photo of Rick in prison saying that the conditions were horrible and he was being treated like a prisoner of war. 13 was filed by the defense on May 15th. Verified motion for temporary restraining order and preliminary injunction. From November 2022 to April 2023, both defense attorneys visited Rick and were allowed to possess their cell phones and computers. It typically occurred in the office of the captain of Westville or other office spaces. Other than the presence of an officer placed immediately outside the door of the various meeting spaces, until a visit on or about April 21st, some semblance of privacy was offered up to the attorneys and defendant Allen. On or about April 5th, so that's two days after Rick confessed on the phone to his wife, the defense filed an emergency motion to modify safekeeping order, which included the various allegations against Westville. On or about April 21st, defense attorney Baldwin and his staff member visited Rick. At all times, they were under constant surveillance of correctional staff who also videotaped the attorney-client conference through a window just outside of the meeting room. Baldwin was prohibited from bringing his cell phone into the visit. Continuing with Document 13, on May 4th, defense attorney Rosie and a staff member visited Rick and were placed in an office approximately 12 feet by 8 feet. In the room, there were four padded chairs and a desk. Rosie offered Rick one of the padded seats. The correctional staff required Rick sit in a plastic chair in the center of the room, facing the interior window, approximately eight feet from the window. The chair was situated so Rick was looking directly into the video camera. Rosie is of the belief that the entire visit, which lasted approximately one hour, was videotaped by prison staff. Never before has Rosie experienced such an infringement on an accused right to confidential communications with counsel. Rosie was prohibited from possessing his cell phone and laptop and had no ability to discuss any part of the voluminous discovery. Just a reminder, discovery is like all the evidence and files. The defense requests a restraining order from videotaping and to allow laptop computers and cell phones. It was later stated that an officer from Westville was only following him with a camcorder without sound. 
so they would have video evidence in case Rick attacked his attorneys. Document 14 was filed by the defense on June 7th. Motion for order on continuing disclosure of defendant's mental health records to be provided to the defense. Prior to incarceration, Rick executed a power of attorney in favor of his wife. I can't have a mistake, not Tom. (laughs) Ha! So OCD. Prior to incarceration, Rick executed a power of attorney in favor of his wife. However, no health care representative directives were executed by Rick. The defendant's attorneys need mental health records, most of which are in possession of the Indiana Department of Corrections, to aid in preparation of his defense, management of his mental and physical state, and to restore his mental and physical health so that he may assist in his own defense. Document 14 continued, Rosie has attempted to obtain Rick's records through the Indiana Department of Corrections, but is required to execute a HIPAA waiver, which will require Rick's signature. Rick is currently in a deteriorating state, no, not Indiana, both mentally and physically, and therefore Rosie has concerns regarding Rick's ability to execute a knowing and voluntary waiver. Rick is approximately one and a half hours away from Rosie's office, and obtaining signatures on a routine basis is burdensome. On Rosie's tires. (sighs) Document 15 was filed by the defense on June 13th. Motion in limine. Nailed it. Regarding ballistics, defense has reasonable cause to believe that the prosecution intends to introduce as evidence the following. The gun and unspent round evidence from the state lab. Request the court to order the prosecutors and witnesses not to mention the existence of any analysis without first obtaining permission of the court outside the presence of the jury. Documents 16 and 17 were the same document, but they were just formatted different. They were filed by the defense on May 3rd. Motion to quash subpoena that had been filed by the prosecution to get Rick's mental health records. The defense said that subpoena is unreasonable because disclosure of the documents violates Rick's privacy rights and the prosecutor is requesting records which are irrelevant as there are no pending matters pertaining to Rick's competency to stand trial, nor has defendant raised the defense of insanity. If eating paper isn't insanity, I don't know what is, eating his bed? Document 18 was filed by the defense on May 3rd, motion to quash subpoena. The prosecutor, also known as Slick Nick, previously requested A. Any and all audio-video recordings of Rick while he is in his cell or being moved from his cell to the recreational area. B. Any notes from any guards, inmates, or other Westville personnel that have made written observations of Rick. C. Recordings of any interviews done with Rick at Westville. D. Copies of any recorded phone calls outside of calls to Rick's attorneys while he was incarcerated in Westville. E. Any written requests made by Rick. F. Any documents, records, notes, videos, and or writings that Westville may have pertaining to Rick. The defense is arguing that the subpoena is unreasonable because A. Documents may contain medical and or psychiatric information and B. Any information derived from interviews done with Defendant Allen by members of the Westville Correctional Facility amount to a violation of Defendant Allen's Fifth and Sixth Amendment rights. So what was the result of this? On May 25th, the motion to quash was denied, so the prosecution has access to these items. Document 19 was filed by the defense on May 3rd, motion to quash subpoena. The prosecution wanted CVS Pharmacy Headquarters to provide Rick's work and attendance records plus personal files. The defense argued it was unreasonable because A, the records are irrelevant and not likely to lead to the discovery of admissible evidence and B, the files may contain information protected. Document 20 was filed by the prosecution on February 13th. State's motion requesting protective order governing discovery. This document was fairly lengthy, but I summarized it in one sentence. Any discovery or evidence sent to Rick should be highly protected by anyone who comes into contact with it, aka keep your mouth shut. Document 21 filed by the defense on May 3rd. Motion to reconsider and request for due process hearing. At no time prior to the issuance of the November 3, 2022 safekeeping order, was there any evidentiary hearing to support the issuance of said order. 
The emergency motion filed on April 5, 2023, requested a hearing to allow Rick to offer up evidence in support of his request. No hearing was afforded. There was no evidence to keep Rick safe at Westville instead of a county jail, so the defense requested a hearing to address this. Document 22 was an incomplete draft for the judge. It was an order. The court, having reviewed defendant's motion to continue bail hearing and jury trial setting, now grants said motion and resets this matter for a bail hearing on blank. They did not fill in the date. I don't know why they included quite a few of these draft documents. Here's another one, document 23 for the judge in complete order. The court, having reviewed defendant's motion to reconsider and request for due process hearing, now sets said matter for hearing on blank. They never filled in the date. Documents 24 and 25 were filed by the defense on May 3rd. Both were a verified request to prohibit public access to a court record. Requests court to prohibit public access to four separate motions to quash subpoena, which were the ones for CVS and Westville. Document 26 was an unsigned draft of Document 20, filed by the prosecution on February 13th. State's motion requesting protective order governing discovery. Any discovery or evidence sent to Rick should be highly protected. Document 27 was filed by the prosecution on January 30th. State's response to defense's petition to let to bail. The state asked the court to not set bail or to release Rick. In support the following request, the state shows the following. Per Carroll County local rules, the defendant is presumed to be held without bond on the offense of murder. The state believes the evidence adds up to strong and evident proof of guilt. Document 28. Only 90 more to go. It was filed by the prosecution on February 13th. State's response to defendant's motion to continue bail hearing and jury trial setting. The state does not object to the defendant's motion to continue, which means to postpone, the bail hearing and jury trial setting. Document 29 was filed by the defense on December 30th. Supplemental motion for discovery and request for Rule 404 and 405 evidence. For this one, the defense pretty much asked the state for all of its evidence, plus information on all witnesses and non-witnesses, RIC, experts, information, and files, the cellular carrier whose records were obtained to determine the location of where calls originated or were received by the identification of cellular tower sites, both personnel and lawsuit files of Tobe Lesenby, Tony Liggett, and Michael Thomas related to their employment with the Carroll County Sheriff Department. Document 30 filed by the defense on February 7th, defendant's motion to continue, postpone, the bail hearing and jury trial setting. Document 31 filed by Theodore Rokita, who is the Attorney General of Indiana. This was from June 19th. Appearance by attorneys in a civil case. It said the state Attorney General will represent the Indiana Department of Corrections. However, I wasn't sure exactly what this was about. Rick's case is criminal, not civil. I'm sure somebody in my comments will clarify. Document 32 dated November 23rd. Appearance form with prosecutor's work contact information. Slick Nick at AOL.com. Document 33, dated November 24th, something similar. It was an appearance for a public defender, and it listed Rosie as Rick's attorney. Document 34, filed by the defense on November 28th. Verified motion for change of venue from the county, Carroll County. They said that Rick can't get a fair trial in Carroll County. The judge later ruled the jury will be selected from Allen County and bust to Carroll County. Greyhound or yellow? Document 35, dated November 14th, co-counsel appearance form, criminal. It listed Baldwin as Rick's attorney. Document 36 was a draft, unsigned, undated order for the judge. Motion to convert let bail hearing into suppression hearing and the court being duly advised in the premises now finds that this motion should be granted, but apparently it was not. I already covered document 37 in the beginning, 22 hours ago. Document 38 was filed by Rick on November 9th. It was his letter to the court asking for a public defender, and I've also already covered document 39 in the beginning. Document 40 was filed by the local media on November 23rd. Media interveners post hearing brief seeking public access to probable cause affidavit and charging information. The media wanted more access to files and hearings. Document 41 was filed by the defense on May 19th. 
notice of discovery, permit the defense to enter Westville for inspecting, measuring, surveying, and photographing the individual cell blocks and surrounding facility. One of the previous documents I already summarized had the exact same thing, so if you're having deja vu, there's a reason. Documents 42, 43, and 44 were basically the same thing where the prosecution on October 27th charged Rick with two counts of murder. So there was one document for each count and then 44 combined both of them. Document 45 was filed by the media on November 21st. Limited appearance by attorneys. Basically, the media was complaining that the PCA was sealed. Document 46 was filed by Kevin Greenlee, who's an attorney and the host of the Murder Sheet podcast. They're big fans of mine. Get in line. It was dated June 8th, requesting public access to sealed court records. The reason all 118 of these documents were finally unsealed was because of this request from Kevin. So thank you, Kevin and Anya from the Murder Sheet, for getting all these documents released. Yeah, thanks for making me spend 20 plus hours on a holiday weekend making this video. Mr. I'm only doing one Delphi video and I'm mortified by my YouTube channel. It's even worse now. Happy 4th of July to all Americans. I'm celebrating my freedom to not have to do a live chat for a while. <laughs> Document 47 was filed by the media on November 23rd. Media intervenors motion for leave to intervene. Basically, they're complaining the PCA was sealed and wanting to speak at the PCA hearing. Document 48 was also filed by the media on February 10th. Media intervenors renewed motion to intervene and motion to grant public access to the state's verified request to prohibit public access. The media wanted to speak at the November 22nd PCA hearing, but were denied, so they tried to seek release of the state's verified request to prohibit public access to the public and order the clerk to release the request to the public. I have no idea what that means. If you're confused by that, so am I, and it's not important. Document 49, filed by the media on November 21st, tried to get requests for PCA and charging information released. Document 50 was filed by Sheriff Toe Blesenby on November 2nd, request to transfer inmate from Carroll County Sheriff to Indiana Department of Corrections for safekeeping. He said that Carroll and White County jails can't protect Rick due to the high-profile case. Document 51, filed by the prosecution on November 22nd, motion for order prohibiting the parties, counsel, law enforcement, court personnel, the coroner, and family members from disseminating information or releasing any extra judicial statements by means of public communication. I covered document 52 in the beginning. These were filed by the prosecution on April 20th. 53 to 55 are the same as 52. So 52 requested mental health records from Westville. The only difference in 53 was for medical records from Westville. 54 wanted employment records from CVS, Rick's employer. And 55 says any and all records from Westville. Document 56 was filed by the Attorney General on June 19th, motion to quash subpoena or enter protective order. Westville did not want to allow the defense to inspect Rick's jail cell. Document 57 was filed by the defense on November 21st, petition to let to bail. They asked for a hearing to let Rick out of jail and prison or to get a reasonable bail based on insufficient evidence. I covered documents 58 and 59 in the beginning. Document 60 was filed by Judge Diener on October 28th, which was the day that Rick's arrest was announced. Court order sealing request and court records pending public hearing. Requested by prosecutor before November 22nd hearing on the PCA release. Document 61 also filed by Judge Diener on the 28th of October. Prosecutor filed PCA probable cause affidavit. And the bond was initially set at $20 million. Document 62 by Judge Diener on October 28th. Pre-omnibus order, jury trial set for March 20th, pre-trial conference set for January 13th, and the rules on providing discovery. Document 63 by Judge Diener on November 2nd, order acknowledging public hearing, and is set the November 22nd hearing to be about sealing the PCA. Document 64 by Judge Diener on November 3rd, court order, Tobe Lesenby requested Rick be transferred from Carroll County Jail on November 2nd. The judge basically wrote that the public and YouTubers are annoying and crazy for information on the case. I agree. And the judge approved Rick's transfer to Indiana Department of Corrections. Document 65 by Judge Diener on November 3rd. Order of recusal and certification to the Indiana State Supreme Court for selection of a special judge outside of Carroll County. Basically, Judge Diener said, peace out, somebody else needs to be the judge. 
Document 66 was filed by his replacement, Judge Gull, on November 14th. Order or judgment of the court. Rick needs a public defender. Baldwin and Rosie were appointed. Document 67 by Judge Gull on November 18th. Courthouse management and decorum order for hearing on November 22nd. It stated the details about how the hearing will proceed and rules for people in the courtroom. Document 68 filed by Judge Gull on November 22nd. Order or judgment of the court. The hearing about the sealing of the PCA. Bail hearing pushed to February 17th. The omnibus date set for February 17th. Also on the same day by Judge Gull, document 69. Order or judgment of the court. The court will consider the media's request for the unsealed PCA. Document 70 by Judge Gull on November 28th. Order or judgment of the court. Unsealing of the PCA. The media request is no longer needed since the PCA will be released. The charging information and affidavit for probable cause will remain sealed. Document 71 by Judge Gull on December 1st. Order or judgment of the court. January 13th court date set to rule on the gag order and the change of venue from Carroll County. Document 72 by Judge Gull on December 2nd. Order or judgment of the court. The gag order was issued after Rick's defense team released a letter with accusations. Document 73 by Judge Gull on January 9th. Order or judgment of the court. January 13th was set for the hearing on discovery and ex parte motion, which was the expert witness about the gun evidence. Document 74 by Judge Gull on January 10th. Courthouse management and decorum order for hearing on January 13th. It was just the rules for the hearing. Document 75 by Judge Gull on January 13th. Order or judgment of the court. The gag order was confirmed. The defense discovery request would be taken under advisement. Change of venue confirmed and will reveal the new county of jurors within a week. Document 76 by Judge Gull on January 24th. Order or judgment of the court. The jury will be selected from Allen County. Document 77 by Judge Gull on February 16th. Order or judgment of the court. February 17th bail hearing has been postponed. Document 78 by Judge Gull on February 16th. Order or judgment of the court. The February 17th hearing was moved one hour earlier. Document 79 by Judge Gull on February 16th. Order granting media interveners renewed motion to intervene and motion to grant public access to the state's verified request to prohibit public access. The media's request to intervene was granted and access to the state's request to prohibit public access, filed on October 28th, will be released. Document 80 filed by Judge Gull on February 17th. It was an order and stated the guidelines for proper handling of discovery. Document 81 by Judge Gull on February 21st. Order or judgment of the court. Bail hearing and new trial date postponed until June 15th to the 16th. Document 82 by Judge Gull on April 14th. Order or judgment of the court. The Indiana Department of Corrections is authorized to move Rick to accommodate his medical and physical needs pursuant to medical directives by Indiana Department of Corrections physicians, psychiatrists, and psychologists. Document 83 by Judge Gull on May 25th. Order or judgment of the court. Approval of the defense's motion to quash the prosecution subpoena of Westville's medical and mental records. The prosecution will be allowed access to Westville's audio video recordings, written observations, recordings, phone calls, written requests, and other documentation. Prosecution access to Rick's CVS work records is also allowed. Document 84 by Judge Gull on May 25th. Courthouse management and decorum order for June 15th hearing. It was setting the rules for the hearing. No electronics allowed in courtroom. Document 85 by Judge Gull on June 16th. It was an order. The defense will be allowed access to Rick's health records from Westville or other care providers assisting Rick. Document 86 by Judge Gull on June 20th. Order or judgment of the court. It postponed the hearing for the motion to suppress until after the defense files its notice of omissions and inaccuracies. Here, the defense team's request to reconsider the safekeeping order. Westville stopped recording Rick's meetings with his lawyers. It granted the defense request to continue receiving Rick's health records. Ex parte motions were heard in regards to the gun expert. And Rick's jury trial was set for January 8th to the 26th in 2024, with the jury coming from Allen County. Document 87 by Judge Diener on October 28th. Order on initial hearing. Initially, Rick said he would hire a private lawyer. 
He entered his not guilty pleas, and he was held without bond until further hearing. Document 88 was just a draft that was never completed to set a hearing date for bail. Documents 89 to 96 were filed by the prosecution on various dates, but all of them were titled Verified Request to Prohibit Public Access to a Court Record. Document 89 was dated October 27th. The prosecutor wanted to seal the charging information and PCA. Document 90 was dated April 14th. I wrote, what is this for? Because nothing was specified. Was it the request for Westville recordings of Rick admitting guilt or for CVS? I'm not sure. Documents 91 to 94 were all filed on April 20th, but it does not specify which documents they relate to. Documents 95 and 96 are the same, dated June 13th. The state makes said request in an effort to remain in compliance with the gag order from December 2nd, 2022. Document 97 by the prosecution on October 27th was the redacted PCA. Document 98 was a draft of the gag order that was not signed. Documents 99 through 102 are the subpoenas for records from Westville and CVS. They were filed by the prosecution on April 20th. Document 103 was a draft order granting media intervenors motion for leave to intervene. 104 was a draft of change of venue and 105 was a draft of media request. Document 106 was filed by Kevin Greenlee from the murder sheet on June 8th. Verified request for access to court records excluded from public access. I reviewed document 107 already. Document 108 was filed by the Chief Justice of Indiana on November 4th, and it replaced Diener with Gull. 109 was filed by the prosecution on January 12th. State's response to supplemental motion for discovery and request for Rule 404 and 405 evidence, in which the prosecution stated the discovery process. Document 110 was filed by both the prosecution and defense on January 20th. Stipulation regarding defendant's verified motion for change of venue from the county. It stated which counties they both agreed the jury should be selected from. Documents 111 to 116 were all subpoenas filed on April 20th by the prosecution. 111 was for Westville documents, health, and video notes, 112 for Westville medical documents, and 113 for CVS. 114 was for Westville documents, the audio and video of Rick in a cell, employee notes, interview recordings, recorded phone calls other than with his attorneys, Rick's written requests, and other documents. 115 was for CVS, and 116 was for Westville. We finally made it to the last slide. Is anybody still awake? This was a draft setting June 15th as the date for the suppression hearing. And finally, document 118, filed by the defense on May 19th, motion to suppress fruits of search of Rick's home, in which the defense argued there was not probable cause. Hopefully this was helpful to somebody who didn't feel like opening up 118 PDF documents and reading through them. Thank you for watching.